Good good morning. Good Good to be back again. Um, Boy, that's hard to follow, something like that, you know? That was beautiful, wasn't it? There's something about music that it's uh, the way heaven speaks. Uh, Just about everything that I read prophetically or in, in the in the book of Revelation is accompanied by a song, many of which we're gonna learn as we uh, go there and become part of that community. I think that God speaks in music. Um, Wouldn't that be cool? I hope he gives me a better voice. (laughs) Amen? What's that all about? I guess the uh, introduction is over. (laughs) I want you to know that um, after Jesus was crucified and uh, while he lay in the tomb, there were lots of people there because of the Passover. And uh, many of them were confused about what had just happened because they had heard stories about this wonderful person that that uh, healed the sick and raised the dead and did all kinds of amazing things and they didn't understand how it ended up that he was, uh, you know, crucified and, this, you know, how the, how the uh, priests had come to the conclusion that that was necessary. And so a lot of people, even some of them that were in the crowds that cried for his crucifixion, even some of them that followed him to Calvary, were looking at the scripture to see if Jesus was a fake or was he real. I hope that uh, that's how we handle our decisions in our lives as we go to the word of God and we see for ourselves if it's truth or it's not because that's the only way we really can do things now. But many of them, including many of the priests who had condemned Christ, uh, came to believe in him and were forgiven of their sins. (laughs) Thank you, Lillian. That's truly good news, isn't it? Uh, Some of the most hardened people um, with, you know, sins in their lives who had condemned the Lord were able to ask for forgiveness, they repented, and Christ gave them his assurance of salvation through his word. That's good news. I don't know if any of you struggle with sin. Um, Maybe not. But if you do, we serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. Yeah? And he seeks to take you at your worst spot and give you confidence in the redemption that he's provided for you. That's what he does. Most people think that when they sin, they better give God some time to cool off. Well, God's not like our parents. Um, He doesn't need to cool off. The Bible says that he stands at the door and knocks. And he hasn't closed the door, we do. And so when we sin, that's the most important time to talk to Jesus because that's, he's eagerly waiting for that to happen. And I know you all recognize that because it is our compulsion or it's our impression when we fall into sin is that we, we need to get on our knees, isn't it? And that's okay. Because we're standing in grace. God has provided grace for us to stand in through, through Jesus. That allows us to make a mistake every once in a while and still know that, that God loves us. And that he has a, a provision for that. We have sort of covered a, the whole, through the whole week quite a few subjects. We've covered what I call the good news of the gospel. And that was my intent uh, setting out. I wanted everybody to know that 
Um, the good news of the gospel is what God has objectively done on our behalf. That is to say, these are things that God does that we have nothing to do with, okay? And you remember the first thing was is that they decide, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost decided to have a plan of redemption for fallen man before man even fell. He knew you before uh, you were born. He knew us before anybody was born or there was any human and he made a plan as he could see ahead and he could see the problem that was coming. He made a plan to redeem us. Amen? Amen. Oh, that is truly love, isn't it? That God, even in his forethought, couldn't bear to be without us. Couldn't bear it. And, uh, and so this plan of redemption included certain things that Jesus would volunteer to do. The first thing that Jesus volunteered to do is he, he volunteered to be born a human. Uh, no small feat in of, of itself, you know, because humanity at the point that Christ came along had already been sinning for 4,000 years. The human condition, the, uh, the, the, the body of uh, the flesh of the human being had already uh, received 4,000 years of sin's uh, effect upon it. Most of the people in Jesus' time were living to about 40 years old. That was about the average. They didn't live long lives. Uh, maybe because babies were dying, and that sort of thing usually sets that tone. But uh, li life was short. People were angry. The saints were unwilling. Um, it was, and yet it was called the fullness of time for Christ to come because when those things are present, God is manifest in even more strength. And so Jesus came at that time, and of all things, I always think about this too, I don't know why, but, you know, at conception, it's just we begin as one cell. And I keep trying to think how the God of the universe could fit into one cell. But somehow that happened, and Jesus was born... Into a, into a situation in which immediately the dragon tried to have him killed. And you know what I'm talking about. Herod sent out people to kill all the babies because Satan was well aware of what was happening with the arrival of Christ. So that's the first thing that Jesus did. And then the Bible says, uh, and I'm thankful for that, right? Are you thankful for that this morning? You know why that's good news? is because Jesus came as the second Adam, right? The first Adam had some problems, and he and his wife sinned, and therefore sin kind of has been passed down through the ages to us, hasn't it? And, um, and really, we, we didn't, you, didn't, you, don't, you didn't have much choice with regards to that, and, uh, and, and so it's very, it's very sad um, that that condition existed. Um, but Jesus came as what we call the second Adam. Paul makes that reference in the book of Romans. And in his life, he was obedient to the law of God, and therefore, he provided escape. Well, how did he provide an escape? He said, I'll adopt you. I'll adopt you as my child. And in, a, in the adoption that God offers through Jesus, we have all the rights and privileges that a, a child who is born to parents has. In other words, Jesus is now our father and friend. And in him, we have incredible riches, incredible things. The, the, the bounty of heaven is ours because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? I hope you take the time to appreciate that notion. So Jesus, when he came, in order to be the second Adam, with a different result, he lived a life without sin. I don't even know how that happened. We'll know someday, but I, I've had four kids. I don't know how he got through teenage years, you know. It's just hard to believe and understand, but it's true. The Bible repeats it over and over again. The next thing that Jesus did, we talked about, was that he, he died at Calvary. And it wasn't his death. Because when he died, he died what we call the second death, which is the death because of sin. And 
that was, in doing that, he was taking our place and dying the second death. That was your death that he died. The, third, uh, the next thing that Jesus did was he was resurrected, and we learned last night if Jesus didn't resurrect, if he didn't arise, that there would be no salvation. That it was, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 goes at great length to explain without the resurrection, we are in pretty bad shape. And so it was great news when Jesus rose up, and uh, because the Bible teaches us that in him we will rise up as well. So we have the hope of the resurrection at this point. I'm certainly glad of that right now because I lost my mom and my brother recently. And, uh, you know, I just can't wait to see them again. Um, today I want to talk about the part that we never talk about. Because I only have one more time to talk to you. And that is the last part of the good news of the gospel. All of those things, by the way, how much did you have to do with all of those things? I just want to ask that. Not a thing, right? So we can say that when I use the word objectively, that is, this is what God did on our behalf, okay? And then subjectively, we can, the Bible asks us, do you believe it? That means this is what I do. Do you believe And if you believe, then it says there's this sequence of fruits, the fruits of of, of belief come into play for us. The last thing that Jesus did was he ascended to the Father. Now, most people don't include this as part of the, you know, the parts of the good news of the gospel, but I do because Jesus is, uh, the Bible we read last night teaches that um, Jesus is in heaven, and he's sitting next to the Father, and he's interceding for you and I. How many of you think you need a little intercession? <laughs> Amen, right? Thank you, Jesus, for interceding on our behalf. And you know how he's doing it? I don't know completely, but I kind of think it goes like this as I read in the book of Revelation. I, I, I kind of think it like he says, well, what do you think about this guy named Jeff. And instead of saying, oh, what a miserable soul, he says, well, you know, Jeff believes in me. And so, Father, I plead my blood. My blood. And God's okay with that. So I want to tell you about the Ascension. It's a very, very exciting story because there's several parts. There's a part A is with the disciples. Part B is the, the, the trip to heaven. And part C is when he gets there. It's most amazing because of all the elements that are involved and all the people involved. Because, you know, sometimes we get human-centric and we think this is all about just us. But this is the story of the universe, and it answers all the questions that the universe has had since Satan has risen up and, and, and started this, uh, um, he started all the sin problem. And so the universe is real interested to see how God resolves everything. So Jesus, you can turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, Jesus takes his disciples to, after being with them for 40 days, after the resurrection, he takes them to the Mount Olives, the Mount Olivet, and he begins to give him them his final instructions and tells them what they should do. Now, there's a, we, we talked about it last night that there was a lot of incidences we found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that were proof that Jesus was resurrected from Peter, James, um, probably a thousand other people, several things like that. Even Paul had the privilege of meeting Jesus. And, and so th- the folks that were going through this had proof. They were spending time with Jesus. And now it was time. Uh, they had acclimated to Jesus again. Jesus, through this period of time, was in his glorified state. Uh, and that's why it was a little hard to recognize him. And, but they came to know him as... Uh, as himself and to see him in that condition. So uh, this is 
the story of after that. We're going to start with chapter 1, verse 2. Or I'll read verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. I love the word infallible. You like that? Uh, your Bible might say something different, but uh, an infallible pr proof just means it's unmistakable, okay? That there was solid proof. Being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God... Jesus uh, was preaching since the, he first came, and by the way, that's what, very important to our lesson today, is when he came, he started speaking about his kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, it was named by different names, and in these last hours with his disciples, he speaks again of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And he being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem or depart from it, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. You remember what he's talking about. Jesus promised them the Holy Spirit would come. In fact, in John 14, he's, or John 16, he says, it's, it's, it's important that I leave. And it'll actually be a good thing for you because I'm going to send the paracletos or the helper or the comforter to you. And through him, uh, uh, your work will be completed. And so uh, there, I think there's four times that he speaks about the Holy Spirit coming to them in John um, 14 through 16. And that's remember, that's in the time period between um, the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, there's a, he, the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. The Father is the one who would send the Holy Spirit, okay? And so that's, you know, the promise he's speaking of. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Well, that had to be exciting, right, for, for the disciples to think about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now, he says. The disciples still don't uh, quite get it. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> Do you understand what they're asking? It's like they're still thinking that this is like, you're going to kick the Romans out kind of thing. And, and so there's still stuff to, for them to learn. And he said to them, how kind he is, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put up in his own authority, but listen to this, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Wow. If I said today that uh, we were going to go out afterwards and we were going to go see people in the community, would you like to know that you're going in power? Yeah, this promises to us because we're the disciples of Jesus Christ, right? And so this is not a something that when we go forth in the name of Jesus Christ that we are wondering if it happens. This is something that happens and we claim it as a promise. We go forth in power. We don't worry about results. We don't worry about those things because we know that in power, whatever ministering needs to be done is going to happen because the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you. Are you satisfied with that? Whenever I get up to speak or I am doing something like that, the thing that I pray more than anything else is, Lord, please empty me out today. Just get rid of Jeff, please, and fill me with your spirit, because I'm not capable of anything in this kind of warfare that's going on between heaven and earth. And so Jesus promises them that they will have power. Now listen to what it says. And now when 
he had spoken these things. While they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly to heaven, he went up, and behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up to heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now, I want to give you a little bit more description here, okay, of what, what is happening. As soon as he was in the cloud, they couldn't see him anymore, but there was more than just him in the cloud, there was a retinue or a large company of angels waiting to escort him back to heaven. Isn't that exciting? Just like it's going to happen in the end at the second coming, there's going to be a great big group. And I don't know. Maybe it's the million that were on the plane or that hundred million that were on the plane. But they were there being quiet as Jesus had this last time with his disciples. And along with that... Who else was resurrected with Jesus when he was resurrected? There were the first fruits of the resurrection. There were people, saints, who were resurrected and they were taken to heaven as well because they were resurrected from the second death as Jesus had died. Not like Lazarus who was resurrected from the first death. And so in the cloud, we've got angels, we've got saints, we've got... And can you imagine how excited they all were. I don't, you know, I can't imagine it. Sometimes I can when I take my grandchildren to something special. You know, they get like so out of hand, crazy excited about it, that it's just unreal, right? And it gives you a little insight. Uh, but I can't imagine how excited they were. And I imagine that the whole thing was, uh, was musical. You know, that they were blowing the horns and the tambourines and they were singing in perfect harmony and they were just glorious music as, as Jesus was received in the cloud. Now, I want you to, I'm, I'm going to take you to a place where we can look at that. Go to Psalms 24. Because now, now we're getting in to the trip. Psalms 24. And this is music um, that is being spoken. So as they're making their way to heaven, the angels and the group that's there has something to say as they're approaching the heavenly city. It's in, we're in Psalms chapter 24 and verse 7. And they, they sing this out loud. They say, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Amen? Wow. Now we got a whole new place excited, Right? That's all of heaven. All of heaven is now excited. And heaven responds. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Oh, they knew who he was. They were just responding because they loved the notion of Jesus coming home. And so they, they're so excited, they repeat it again. Lift up your heads, O oh you, oh you gates, and lift them up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Oh, and who is this king of glory? A response again. The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. All of heaven is, re is rejoicing. The retinue that is with Jesus is rejoicing. And it's, it's amazing who was there in heaven to receive him. And that's where we're going to go next, okay? Go over to Revelation chapter 4. This is, this is probably the book I spend more time studying than any other book in the Bible. Um, I love to teach it. Revelation chapter 4. Now when you read prophecy like this, 
you have to be very careful and very perceptive. You need to read every word as important so that you're not missing something. And there's, there's a couple uh, misses that are easy to do in, in, in this section. But first off, the, chapter 4 describes the throne room before Jesus gets there. Okay, And then chapter 5 describes it as he arrives. So we're, I'm going to go through both and it's going to describe some things. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. See, they opened the door, didn't they? They opened the door, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you the things that must take place after this. That's, that's for John. Immediately, I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on it, on the throne. And he who sat there was like Jasper, and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, an appearance like an emerald. Um, yeah, those colors are all very important, by the way, um, especially the last one, because blue always represents the law of God, and uh, so we see blue throughout. Some, uh, uh, some people think the Ten Commandments were actually blue emeralds, and, um, and so, um, interesting. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, Emerald to me, yeah. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. We, we need to identify them in a little bit, and we need to be very specific about it. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. We've talked about the seven spirits of God before. We saw that in Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, that it's just a dissemination of who God is, the God of, the, the, the God of uh, knowledge, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom. There's seven of those. And we see how in the Old Testament that oftentimes somebody would get this, a singular thing, like Solomon received the spirit of wisdom, right? One of the, my favorite uh, historical figures is Daniel, and if you go through Daniel, you'll find out that Daniel had all seven of the same ones that were, that were laid upon Jesus Christ. Jesus was full completely of the spirit, of the complete spirit. And by the way, you can be too. The same spirit that rested upon Jesus will rest upon you if you ask the Lord. It's available to us. Okay, verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne there were four living creatures full of eyes in the front and the back. And the first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who is and is to come. Um, by the way, um, Ezekiel describes these as the um, cherubim in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel 10. Verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor thanks to him who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. This is just a celebration scene of what's going on inside the throne room as they anticipate the coming of our Lord. I know I'm reading a lot, but hang in there, okay? Just hang in there. Just read with me. We're in chapter 5 now. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? 
and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And so John says, I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Amen? I have a feeling it's something good, right? This is something good that Jesus is able to do. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. I want you to notice something. This is one of those little things that if you don't take the time to pick it out, you could read right through it, is that the first time we saw the seven spirits, they were before the throne of God, and this time the seven spirits are where? What does it say? What does it say? Where are they? The seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. Okay, so first they're at the throne. Jesus comes and they're sent out to all the earth. What did Jesus say about the Holy Spirit? He said, I have to go go to the Father so I can send you the paracletos or the comforter. So we see that happening right here. If you didn't pay attention, real close attention to the notion there or what he says that the seven spirits were sent out to all the earth, you wouldn't know either what time it is in this prophecy or what happened. When Jesus arrives on the scene, he immediately sends the seven spirits to the earth. And guess what's happening when this is going on? What do you think is happening? What happened down on earth at that point? Pentecost, didn't it? And Pentecost is when the disciples received the power of the Holy Spirit, didn't they? And they changed the world. See how this all connects together? This is important for us to know that Jesus did exactly what he said he would do. And the Holy Spirit was sent immediately to the disciples. And they were able to begin the ministry that he And they did it with power. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, we don't know who all these people are, but we do know that all of the universe is represented in this story. There's people who are representatives from other unfallen places. There's people who are representatives of the angels. There's people who are, there's those who are representative of uh, the hierarchy of angels. There is the people who have been raised from the dead who are there. And of course, there's Jesus and the Father. So this is quite a party. And they sang a new song saying, now this is, uh, we, we have to be careful here. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, and people, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, I'm reading New King James, and there's only two Bible versions that say it that way, the King James and the New King James, because if you look at this, it looks like these are redeemed from the world. You see what I'm saying? Because it says, in my Bible, you have redeemed us to God by your blood. But what I want you to know is that the pronoun there, us, is also them. It's just these authors chose us, okay? And if you read it this way, then what you're saying is that there are the 24 elders that have to be humans who have been saved. But um, after lots of research, um, I, the conclusion I've come to is this is that the 24 elders are, are uh, angels, in fact, angels. And that he's not talking about humans being redeemed. He's just saying 
and have redeemed them to God by your blood. That's just as equally a good translation as the us, out of every tribe and tongue and people, and have made them kings and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Okay? See why you have to kind of dig deep? Because that could be confusing, uh, especially as you read other sources. Like um, I found uh, at least three or four passages in Spirit of Prophecy that say they were angels. And uh, so that helped me understand a little bit better. Okay, so that's kind of the story. And it goes on to, again, saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, wisdom. And there's all these uh, beautiful sayings that are talking about Jesus. So there's this great conflagration in heaven where all of heaven, all the universe has come together. And they realize that the, the, what Christ has done is complete from beginning to end, because he, remember what he said on, on the cross, the last thing he said was, it is finished. And, and, and his light, his face lighted up like the sun when that happened. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I know what that did. I kind of know what that did to the, the, the priests who were there that put him on the cross, because they were terrified from that point forward. So why is it so important now because the lamb um, takes his seat with the father on the throne of heaven why is it so important to us in terms of the gospel that Jesus ascended to heaven we've already mentioned one reason and that is because um, from there he could send the Holy Spirit which we desperately need in our lives but also because um, because it completed the task that needed to take place. So today's text that we read, let's go over there to Ephesians chapter 2 now and start to look at the gospel significance of the ascension. Now, every phase of the good news of the gospel is done because of the love of God and his desire for mercy in us. In fact, uh, Paul in Ephesians here says it's because of his great love with which he loved us. And that, that, of course, is agape or unconditional love. That when we were dead in trespasses, just like he said in Roman, when we were still sinners... He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. He made us alive together. We were dead in trespasses, and he made us alive. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, it's hard to be here in the world today. It's hard because there's so much bad stuff going on, isn't there? It's hard to not get caught up in all the bad stuff, right? It's hard to uh, go through the pain of all the bad stuff that happens in our lives. Um, you know, I, and I don't mean to keep bringing this up, but I've been saying goodbye to people for the last seven months. It's hard to not get distracted by that spiritually. Do you understand what I'm saying? And... And yet, Jesus says, I have a solution for you, Jeff. If you've got stuff going on in your life and the world is encroaching upon you, Jesus says, listen, this is how it is. Remember that I've adopted you. You're my child. And so if I'm in heaven, so are you. You are in heaven, in heavenly places, sitting with Jesus. Can you say amen? amen? Now, I know that takes a whole lot of belief, right? It takes a whole lot to believe that because we got all the senses working on, it, on us and all the bad stuff that's happening here, and it just makes it like, oh, that, that is impossible for me to believe that way. But that's not true because Jesus wouldn't have said it unless it was a truth. And so it's our privilege as his children, to say in the midst of the pain, the darkness, the situations we find ourselves in, we can say, you know what? 
I'm sitting in heavenly places with my Lord. Psychologists would look at you and say, oh, that's just escapism. I'm okay. If you want to escape to heaven, go there. <laughs> because there's love there. And there's, there's help there. And so, you know, when your next door neighbor comes over and they've got signs on their car and in their windows about politicians and the, the evil that exists in the world, God says to you, hey, look, you, it's really a good idea if you don't take a side here. Okay, stay with me now, because I don't want you to, to, to misquote me. It's really good that you don't, don't take a side here, because if you do, you've lost the opportunity to witness to the whole other side. Okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, the only reason I exist anymore is to serve my Lord Jesus Christ and witness to other people. I am diminished in the world. If I'm going to be Holy Spirit filled, God wants me to reach the current president or the one before because he'd like to see them both in heaven, even if you don't want them there. That's God's idea. Because he would, if he could, he'd save the whole world, wouldn't he? Now that's real love, isn't it? So this is why this is such an important thing that Jesus did, is he gives us this option, right? Right? He doesn't, we, all this ethnicity stuff that's going on, he also says to us, listen, yeah, there's sin in the world, and people are prejudiced, people take advantage of other people, all those things, but you're not going to do that, are you, my children? You're not going to do that. Because if you take one position, then you've frozen yourself out on the other side. Right? And so we're... We're in a place where Jesus is trying to say to us now, he says, okay, well, listen, because I've been talking to you about the kingdom of heaven all along, and this is really what the kingdom of heaven is, is, is that we have a desire in our heart, despite what's going on around us, to reach everybody with the good news of the gospel. Amen? Amen. And when we do that, we do it with the agape love of Jesus Christ in our hearts. It's really hard for people to continue in a position of defiance if you begin to love them unconditionally. Really hard. And that's what God is asking of us. He's, he's saying to us, listen, you, you don't even have to construct it in your life. Because you couldn't. You can't construct the notion of agape in you. You barely can love other humans. Right? Isn't that true? Yeah. You barely can love your wife or your husband or your children. You think you love them to the moon and back, but not like God loves you. And so we have to pray. We have to pray every day that the Holy Spirit will come to us and fill us with the agape love of Jesus Christ, of God. That's the answer, right? I don't want to leave the house and just try to be nice and loving to people. I want them to experience God as they visit with me. Okay? Are you there out there? Is anybody out there? Yeah. Amen. Okay. This, this changes the game, folks. Because before, before I learned this, I thought that I had to produce that. I thought somehow I just had to be better. I just had to be... Uh, you know, learn the ways of God and, and just be better to people, and that would do it. But guess what? My better fell short. My better fell short. The only thing that truly attracts people to God is to see Jesus in you and to understand the love that he offers Now, God's so excited about this plan, Jesus is excited about this plan, that he says to us, listen, uh, in my kingdom, there's some of the same things that you've experienced before, uh, but because my kingdom is the kingdom of heaven, you, um, you know, your experience is now that you're an ambassador from heaven. That's your new experience. Now, an ambassador has a different kind of relationship with the country that, 
they enter. Isn't that correct? In fact, they can't get arrested. Did you know that? Right? They can just go and... I don't think that that's what ambassador, the kind of ambassador that God's talking about. Um, but he's talking about us being an ambassador for what? An ambassador for the kingdom of heaven whose primary function or, or um, element is love. That's the primary thing. So he says, okay, so I want you to go out in the world, and the main thing you need to do is love people with the agape love of God. That's it. Your ambassadorial, I think that's a word, your ambassadorial function is to love people with the love of God. That might turn itself into sharing with them the word of God. It might turn itself into sharing with them other things. It also might be just loving them as Christ would love them. You know, I, I spent a lot of time uh, reading and writing about this topic and that most of the time the, the opening to the door of the heart with the, the scripture is through uh, something that's in a person's life that's blocking the way. It could be something physical. It could be something mental. It could be something that they just can't get over. They, they can't hear anything you say about God because there's something that's distressing them in their lives. And, and God says, okay, well, also in that way, I will help you so that you can get past that with the individual. What do I mean by that? Well, look at what Jesus did. He healed a lot more people than he did uh, get followers. I mean, if all the people Jesus healed, John says it, th there wouldn't be a book large enough, right? Right? to record everything. He says that in the last chapter of his gospel. And so the way we do that often is we just come close and we pray to the Lord and we say, Lord, how can I come close to this person and break down the barriers that are keeping them from hearing or seeing you? Are you with me? That's called medical missionary work. Um, I've done it in some of the weirdest ways, and it almost always works. Uh, I can remember at 19 years old, I was living in Haiti, and the thing they asked me to do was teach mothers how to breastfeed their children. And I said, man, I'm right up for that. <laughs> yeah? But I did it, and I was able to reach people for Christ through that experience, because I just prayed and prayed and prayed. I said, Lord, I did not bargain for this. Yeah, I wanted to teach English. <laughs> Sometimes you do the craziest things. You know, you don't know what it is. I've, I've been in a house in the city of Allentown. It's about, you know, maybe one... 10 by 10 or something like that. All I know, what I know is, is that there were only two mattresses in the one room that existed in the corners of the mattresses met because there were children, three children and two adults living in that condition. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, what do we do here? What do we do here? What do we do here? I, I don't know. You get them another mattress. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. You give them food. All those basic things, because most people in the world, as I've traveled and I've been to different places, most people in the world aren't thinking about the bigger things of life. They're thinking about what's the next meal going to be, right? And when we open the door like our Lord did to those things, we open the door to them hearing about the love that was willing to do that unconditionally. Okay? Now, I know that this town has lots of people who have conditions that are blocking them from able, being able to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you know that? You probably know some of those people, right? And so sometimes what we do first before we just, you know, give them the good word of God is we open the doors to them to maybe feed them or to take care of them or to reach out to them. This is hard to do. This is hard to do when we're needy as well, right? 
It's hard to help other people with their needs and things like that when we have needs. Yeah? And so one of the things that I know about this is that Isaiah says that when we begin to do this for others, our own needs are taken care of. Amen? Amen? That when we step outside of ourselves and we say, I'm gonna, I, I know I've got some bad stuff going on. I'm not a great person. I'm not a good Christian. I'm not baptized. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not this. And I can't do it. But if you say, but I'm going to do it anyway, Lord, if you'll bless me. He says, yes, I will bless you. And when you take and put your foot in the water, it parts. Are you with me? When you put your foot in the water, it parts. So we decide to become people who minister to people just like Jesus did. That's what this is all a part of. He left us here with a specific assignment to be ambassadors. And those ambassadors are the ones who are to reach people who are lost in the world so that when Jesus comes the next time, there'll be many. And he's going to come with the same hundred million plus angels to receive all of us. I think I told you the story before about mom. I knew her time was short, but I thought she was still listening. So I began to read to her the last text, the text that talk about what happens after you die and, and, and when Jesus comes again. And so I began to read, like, uh, let not your heart be troubled, right? You believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. And then I read to where I said, uh, Mom, you're going to fall asleep for a little bit. You won't even know how long. And the next thing you see will be Jesus. Wow. My brothers and sisters didn't think it happened, but I swear she blinked. <laughs> and I said, you know, when you see Jesus, everybody else will be there. But you're lucky. You get, to call, you get called into the clouds first. So please wait for me. We, we have these, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we have these privileges as children of God. We can speak to people even at that point in their lives and share with them the good news of what's about to happen. There are so many people who need to hear what you have learned and what you know. So many, and it would bring so much comfort to their hearts if we could just get over ourselves a little bit. By the way, I believe Jesus is coming soon. I believe we're not long away until the second coming. The signs are rich. The last sign that appears to be is, is, is the church are the people of God ready? Are you ready to do what God has asked you to do before his son returns? Are you anticipating the idea that when Jesus comes, that there's no time left for anybody else who hasn't asked for forgiveness? Are you thinking about the ones you love? Are you thinking about the ones you know across the street? Are you thinking about those who haven't accepted Jesus Christ that they might lose out on eternity? They might lose out on all that God has to bless us with. Are you thinking about them 
When you go into a crowd, do you cry out to the Lord saying, Lord, there's so many here who need to know you. What can I do? This has to be our attitude. This has to be our desire. And only the Holy Spirit can put it in us. Amen? Amen. Sorry, I didn't mean for it to be emotional today. I just wanted you to know, as I have from the beginning, how much God loves you. And he loves you unquestionably. He loves you unquestionably. And he's just asking you, do you know anybody that could use that in their lives? This morning, uh, I'm going to ask the guys, because you know I don't hold back, I'm going to ask the guys to pass out cards again. I'm going to ask you a few questions, and you can check it off. Nothing too heavy, like, you know, I'm not asking you to give all your life savings to me or anything like that. (laughs) There's five um, blocks there. You can check whichever one you want. Um, put your name on it, put your telephone number on it, put your address on it. One of the things I asked you to do during the week last week is to start asking each other to come to your home for, for dinner. Uh, and I've already heard the story about SpaghettiOs and bread or something like that. And I know that some of you have done that already. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'll eat SpaghettiOs at anybody's house. But what I would like you to do is to, to, before you leave today, is to think about somebody here that you'd like to invite over to your home and just have a meal with, right? Get to know the church better, okay? And I'll be checking on you. (laughs) Number one, I am interested in learning more about the Bible and would like Bible studies. That's an easy one. That's an easy one. I am interested in learning more about the Bible and would like Bible studies. <laughs> Number two, there is a baptism coming up soon, and y- if you are interested in being baptized or to be prepared to be ba- ba- baptized, you want to check that one. You know what I threatened to do today? I threatened to get it in the baptismal tank with the water full and stay there until somebody came up and was baptized. I think some of you would have felt sorry for me after a little while. Well, I might have done it, so. Number three, I would like to be rebaptized. My life kind of has uh, slipped away from me, my life in Christ, and I think a rebaptism would be good for me. Number four, I would like a visit. You want somebody to visit you. And number five, I really need a special prayer request. A special prayer request. And if you want, you can write that on the front where it says prayer request. And we can uh, bring that before the body. And you'll have a whole group of people praying for you. Amen? Well, thank you uh, for allowing me to come and be with you. I've grown to love many of you. And, um, you know, when you do these types of things, it's always the speaker that gets the most out of what's going on because you got to prepare and you always overdo it. And so I'm happy to have been here. I pray that the Lord Jesus has pressed in, in, in your heart the need for you, his need for you, and that he loves you to the utmost, and all of heaven is waiting, just like they were waiting for Jesus, for us to enter into those gates. That's my prayer in Jesus' name.